right. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, so glad you can join us today. Um, so I'm Kelly Froelich. I'm the new small ruminant specialist here at South Dakota State University. And I'm glad you can join us today for kind of the basics of dewormers and um, fecal egg counting. So oh, it's not moving forward. So I guess um, just to kind of start off with, I wanted to give a little bit an overview of um, myself. Um, I recently finished up my PhD last year and the focus of my PhD was really kind of looking at loline, which is a, um, a secondary metabolite found in a lot of fescue type grasses, how it was metabolized in sheep and seeing if it had any effects on internal parasites. Um, so that's kind of really where my knowledge of, you know, internal parasites come from. Um, and also I have a flock of my own sheep. So I know some of the problems and stuff that comes with raising small ruminants and some of the issues um, that can happen with uh, internal parasites. Um, but I just kind of wanted to put it out there, you know, I'm not a vet. Um, so any recommendations and stuff, you should definitely always check, you know, with your vet and work with them on developing a, you know, parasite management plan for your flock. So to kind of start off with like a brief introduction to internal parasites. So internal parasites, you can really kind of classify into two different um, types. You have your multicellular and you have your single cell protozoa. So the multicellular, um, these can kind of further be broken down into three groups. So you have your nematodes, also known as roundworms or strongle type worms. Um, your cestode type worms, um, which are like flatworms, tapeworms, that sort of thing. And then trematodes, um, which you can think of like liver flukes. So if we have any people from Minnesota on here, I know some times in, in parts of Minnesota, liver flukes can be a huge issue. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, just because I only have an hour, um, just talking about, you know, nematodes, because um, those are usually kind of the ones that we think of the most problematic in um, both sheep and goats. Um, your cestodes, you know, like your tapeworms and stuff, you definitely can see them in your sheep. Um, they're not generally thought of as a huge problem for small ruminants, just because the they're not as pathogenic. So, you know, tapeworms, um, if you ever have seen, you know, big like white looking worms in the feces of your animals, you know, those are generally going to be tapeworms, but um, in most instances, we don't really worry about them because they don't cause a lot of um, harm to the animal and usually it's better just to leave them be. Um, and then your single cell protozoa, you know, that's, you know, things like coccidia, you know, crypto, jardia, um, those sort of things. But yeah, you can spend a lot of time talking about parasites, but just for this um, particular presentation, the focus is going to be on nematodes. So to kind of start off with, um, I just wanted to give, you know, I've heard some confusion with a lot of people, you know, when you talk, when you do a fecal sample and your vet says that you have strongles, you know, what does that mean? So nematodes, you know, they're, they're roundworms. And basically nematode, if you remember way back to high school biology, you know, where you had to um, remember the classification of things, you know, nematodes is basically the phylum. Um, so as you go, I don't know if you learned any acronym to learn, um, learn this, you know, I learned like King Philip came over from Germany Sunday kind of thing. But, you know, as you go down, you know, the order of things, you know, it gets more and more specific into things. So nematodes is the phylum. And then as you go down, stronglid is the family name. Um, and that's where kind of strongles come from. And in general, when we're talking about internal parasites in small ruminants, nematodes, roundworms, strongles, they're all generally talking about the same thing. And I thought that was important to kind of point out because I've heard some confusion, you know, you know, when your vet's talking about you have strong goals or whatever, you know, it's pretty much the same thing. So when we're referring it to ruminants. So in small ruminants, you know, the, there's generally three um, nematodes that are considered the most problematic. They're definitely are not 
all of the worms, um, but you know the three that are most talked about. And the top one is Homunculus contortus. Um, this one definitely gets most of the spotlight. Um, it's you know referred to as a barber pole worm or vampire worm. Um, that's the one that everybody seems to be um, most concerned about and should be because it's usually the most pathogenic. Um, but then you can also get, um, so your trike worms, um, the second one, this black scour worm, and um, you, these brown stomach worms um, are also, you know, quite pro, um, prevalent in both sheep and goats. So homunculus contortus, like I said, is probably the most problematic worm. And I'm not going to go through all the different, you know, the top three worms, but this one I did kind of want to point out. Um, so this one's really unique in that, you know, it's very destructive. Um, so definitely the most problematic and prevalent worm. Um, so basically what happens, you know, it... Um, lives in the abomasum of animals and it causes damage to stomach lining. So uh, on this picture to the right, this is actually a picture from a lamb that was infected with homunculus contortus and all these like red little scribbles on um, this piece of tissue is worms. So, and these worms basically, you know, they have a kind of like a needle um, if you can see in the top uh, right picture, you know, that pierces the stomach lining and it causes, um, well, it, it feeds off of the blood of the animal. So it causes high mortality and morbidity. Um, so the average worm sucks about 0 0.05 mils of blood a day, which doesn't seem like a lot. Um, but if you have enough of these worms, it can equate up to about a cup of blood loss a day in an animal. And the females, they lay about 5,000 eggs a day, which is a lot. So, you know, this is the, one of the reasons why this worm is so problematic is that it just reproduces so fast. Um, so yeah, on the bottom here, I have an example. So if you have a sheep that has 300 female worms, you know, you're gonna be losing 15 mils of blood a day and you're gonna have about 1.5 million eggs being laid per day. So that adds up to quite a bit. Um, and that's why they re reproduce so fast. Um, so as producers, we probably all know this, but paratism is a huge problem. Um, and the best way that I've heard it kind of describe is, you know, looking at it like an iceberg. What we see is kind of the tip, everything underneath it is just like subclinical issues that are, you know, affecting your animals, but maybe not in a way that you know that they're affecting um, your animals. And, you know, the problem with paratism is, you know, that subclinical, you know, kind of affects, you know, that's going to affect your bottom line, it's going to affect how your lambs are growing, um, how they're producing, and that sort of thing. And this problem is becoming compounded by the fact that every dewormer that we have for our small ruminants, there's been some documented resistant, um, especially with like homunculus condoritus, um, homunculus has been shown resistant to every type of dewormer that will affect it. Um, in the U.S., I mean, we don't have any newer dewormers coming down the pipeline anytime soon. Um, you talk about, like, Ivermect um, came out in the 80s, which was before I was born, and we're still using it as a tool. Um, so preserving the, you know, uh, dewormers that we have is really important if we want to keep using those as tools. Um, in goats, especially, you know, paratism is a huge problem. Um, and partly it's due to the metabolism of goats. They just, you give them drunk, you know, you deworm them. Um, it gets metabolized through their body really fast. Um, so you see kind of um, resistance in goats more than sheep. Um, in a lot of places. And according to the USDA, about one in four non-predator deaths in goats is due to parasites, right? So even if you're a sheep people person, you can, you know, kind of take a note from the goat um, people that, you know, it's 
you know, not unrealistic that maybe at some point down the road that we would see these kind of numbers in cheap too. So we really need to take care with the tools and stuff that we have. Um, and then I guess the last point is, you know, parasite animals require extra nutrients, especially protein. Um, and this is where I was kind of talking about those subclinical issues that they're really going to cut into your bottom line um, as a producer, um, just because, you know, those worms are going to be robbing nutrients that are meant for the animal. So this is, you know, dependent on, you know, worm species, but, you know, some of those, you know, symptoms and stuff that we see. So your clinical um, symptoms that, you know, you can visually see, you know, is going to be your sudden death, um, anemia, uh, so your diarrhea, loose stools, weakness, or bottle jaw. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, subclinical is where we really, um, there's a lot of problems, you know, because of we can't see those problems, but they are there and they affect, you know, our production, you know, they're going to reduce your appetite, you know, of your animals, which can affect them from, um, if you have growing animals, it can affect their weaning weights, um, the reproduction, milk production, you know, all of these things, it has a chain reaction. So when I talk about, you um, or when I introduce, you know, parasitism to people, you know, I always like to talk about kind of the life cycle of parasites because it's important to know if we're going to try to use the tools and stuff we have effectively, it's important to know, you know, this life cycle. So half the time, you know, the worms are spent in the animal. Um, they reproduce in the um, different um, either the abomasum or small intestine, depending on what type of worm you have. And these um, mature uh, worms will reproduce. They deposit eggs onto the pasture. And from there, these eggs, you know, hatch into what we call a second stage um, juvenile. And they, when the conditions are right and stuff, they'll um, molt and they'll move into what is called a third stage juvenile, where they actually crawl up the blades of grass. And the third stage is um, when it's effective to both goats and sheep, because that's when the animals consume it. Um, so it's about this whole life cycle from being laid um, the eggs being laid down um, and to complete it, it's about three weeks, so 21 days. And that's a kind of an important number to know when you're talking about pasture management and that sort of thing to kind of prevent um, these reinfections. Um, and the second kind of note that I wanted to say about worm biology is that worms are really adapted to survive. Um, so Worms, um, they're pretty smart. They know when the weather is not good to hatch out and when it's, you know, ideal to hatch out. So in animals, um, like going into fall and stuff, they go into what's called an arrested development, um, which basically, you know, after the animal has consumed, you know, larvae in that L3 stage, you know, they go into the um, stomachs of the animals, they, you know, mature into this L4 stage, which is usually the stage where they burrow into, you know, the stomach of the animal, and basically they hang out there for the winter. So what that means is, you know, when we have um, like worm, the most, the peak worm burdens that we see in like sheep or goats is usually spring and midsummer. So spring um, we see these L4 starting to basically hatch out and it seems they kind of know when a goat or a sheep, you know, starts to kid, um, basically because, um, or lamb, I should say, um, that lambing kidding period, you know, reduces the immune systems and then the worms know, hey, you know, it's springtime, I can come out and they take advantage of that you or doe, you know, has a depressed immunity and can really thrive. Um, these worms also, you know, this is a huge misconception that in this area, because of our winters and stuff, um, that worms can't survive, you know, outdoors in the pasture or, you know, even inside. And that's not true. Um, 
when they're in that younger stage, they have kind of a hard like protective layer that can actually prevent, um, help keep them alive um, even in our Midwest winters. Um, so, I mean, it's good to keep in mind that, you know, just because you get, you think you get rid of them, you know, before the start of winter doesn't mean that they're completely gone. They can still, some can still survive. And again, this is, in the, this is going to be dependent on the year and um, the temperature and that sort of thing. Um, and then I guess one of my other points, you know, to bring out was basically so the ideal hatching temperature, you know, for when that egg hits the ground is about um, when it's above 50 degrees Fahrenheit in about 80% humidity. Um, when it starts getting, you know, too hot or it's too cold, you know, they won't hatch out as much. So like I said, worms are kind of smart. They're adapted to survive. Um, and that's just kind of, you know, something to keep in mind because some years, you know, you're going to have a lot heavier parasite burdens than others. Um, and that's just how it is. And a lot of it's dependent on weather factors. So um, generally, because it takes, you know, three weeks from the time eggs are laid to, you know, them kind of maturing as adults in the animals. Um, that's why we see the peak of our um, worm burdens in that July, August range. Um, in our animals. So when we talk about control of internal parasites, I kind of like to think of it in three segments. Um, the first one is, you know, to make sure that you're always treating your animals properly when you're using your dewormers. And I'll go into more of this in the following slides. But my second point is kind of, you know, do what you can to minimize parasite challenge. If you can try to kind of break that parasite life cycle, that's going to help you a lot in preventing reinfections in your animals. And then lastly, you know, over you or avoid overusing dewormers and kind of maintain um, refuge is the term that they use. Um, one of the fastest ways to develop resistance to dewormers is just, you know, using it a lot. So um, my first point, so treat properly. So what do I mean by this? Um, know your worms and know your drench. Um, so every, you know, class of dewormers is, you know, slightly different and um, they affect different stages of um, worms. So it's always good to kind of read the labels and make sure that, you know, if you know you have a lot of homunculus contortus, I know a lot of the dewormers um, treat them. Um, that's probably not a good example. I'll just, okay, I'll pick, so like Minnesota people, I know there's a lot of liver flukes in Minnesota. There's only one dewormer that treats liver flukes. So if you're trying to use um, a de dewormer that's not effective for liver flukes, basically you're gonna help contribute to a resistant problem because your dewormers is just not effective for your worm. Um, when you're using dewormers, it's important to make sure you use a proper dose. Um, so this is just, you know, making sure that whatever drench gun you're using is, you know, giving the intended dose, you know, if it's broken or missing pieces or, you know, it's inconsistently, you know, giving a dose, um, that can create problems in that, you know, if you're under dosing an animal, it's not going to be killing all of the worms in the stomachs. Um, it's also important, you know, when you talk about your dewormers is to use a non-expired product, right? So if you, um, let's say you used your dewormer last fall and you threw it in the truck and it got left in there all winter, I would not use the product. Even if it's not expired, you know, it's important to read the labels and understand that they have you know, there are storage requirements um, to those products. Um, and they do, you know, after a certain period of time, if they go past their exp expiration date, you know, they become just less effective. Um, so it's important to kind of, you know, keep an eye on that and make sure that you're using a product that was stored properly, but also not expired. 
Um, another point that I always kind of like to bring up is use an oral drench. Um, so I know, especially in the goat world, um, sometimes, you know, an injectable or sometimes porons are, you know, used. And these just, there's been a lot of, well, I shouldn't say a lot of research, but there has been research shown that they're just less effective. Um, if you have an oral drench, use that before you grab, you know, an injectable or a pour on or something like that. Um, you know, when we talk about the major in, um, internal parasites in sheep and goats, you know, they're in the abomasum, they're in the intestine of the animal. And if you can give an oral drench, um, it's basically delivering a direct, you know, hit to those worms and making sure that it's killing as many as possible, which is what we want. And then lastly, just, you know, this might be common sense, but just making sure that drench is swallowed. Um, I know for younger animals like lambs and stuff, if you're, um, you, okay, well, make sure your drench is swallowed, but then also make sure that, you know, when you're drenching them, that you're putting the drench gun in the back of their mouth. If you put the product on their tongue, like especially in lambs, um, they can have what they call like esophageal groove closure. So when they're younger, they can drink milk, they shunt milk from their mouth, you know, to the abomasum directly and they skip over the rumen. And if that happens um, and you skip over the rumen, basically, you know, that, the speed of that um, dewormer is going to be sped up and it's not going to have as much time in the body to have an effect against worms. And um, I guess one more last note on that is, you know, if you have an animal that spits out the drench, it's always better to re-drench them and make sure they have enough. Um, dewormers, you know, they have a high level of safety margin on it. The only one that might be an exception is um, like Prohip, Prohit. Um, so, you know, it's better to make sure that, you know, they're getting an intended dose. If they spit it out, you know, it's not gonna be as effective at killing as many worms as possible. So when we talk about dewormers, um, Generally, there's three classes of dewormers. So you have your white wormers. These are your like balbazin, your safeguard, um, those sort of things. You have your, the second group is your mac macrocyclic lactones, um, which are kind of, they're known as your persistent dewormers. So your ivermectin, your cydectin, these ones tend to stay in the body um, a lot longer than other types of dewormers like your valbazin. And then the last group of dewormers that we have in the U.S. is the nicotinic etogenist. Um, so you're like prohip. Um, and, you know, it's when we talk about, you know, dewormers and talking about classes of dewormers, it's kind of important to have this in your back of your mind, too. You know, for a long, long, long time, um, they the expert opinion was that you should switch dewormers, you know, to kind of prevent um, resistance. And while switching dewormers does help prevent um, resistance from occurring, you have to switch your class of dewormer, not just the, you know, um, name of the dewormer. So if you drenched with Ivermec, and then you're like, oh, I need to switch my dewormer and you switch it to Cydectin. It's still in the same class of dewormer. It still has, um, so like that switching of the dewormer is not gonna be effective because it, it falls in the same class of dewormer. Um, so which drench should you use? Um, the drench that you should use on your property should be the one that's most effective. Um, so generally when we say considered most effective, it usually means that it's dewormers that are 95% or greater effective. Um, so this is, you know, measuring, um, which, you know, I'll talk about in a little bit, you know, measuring your fecal egg counts, you know, what it was before you drenched and what it was afterwards. And basically you wanna see a reduction in fecal egg counts by 95% or greater. Um, and some ways, you know, 
a lot of farms have resistance. And if you're one of those farms that are struggling with it, you know, one thing that you can do to kind of increase that efficacy is repeat dosing in 12 hours or 24 hours for um, dewormers like ProHit. And this basically um, doubles the drenching power, you know, of your drench and allows you ability to use that for longer if you're starting to experience, you know, a resistant problem. Um, but if you're at the point of where you're kind of, ex you know, experiencing um, kind of uh, resistance, um, it's also good to, you know, follow up with a vet and kind of come up with a plan on ways that you can use, you um, non-drench means of kind of um, preventing, you know, the parasites from becoming more resistant. Um, so some other, you know, um, I guess methods of increasing, you know, efficacy of drenches is using two or more drench groups sequentially. So this means, you know, if you're, um, let's say you have your sheep in the race, you're gonna drench with one product and then switch classes of dewormer and drench it again. It's, again, this is a, you know, it's a method to increase efficacy and making sure that you're killing all the worms um, in the animal, but you do have to be careful because, you know, if you're just using one drench um, and you use that until basically you can't and you, you know, it's not effective for your farm anymore, you're only developing resistance to one. If you're using two or more drenches, then basically you can start developing resistance to all of these drenches automatically. Um, but usually like it, if you buy in animals or something like that, you wanna clean them out before you introduce them, you know, to your main mob. Um, so using two or more drenches to make sure that they're completely cleaned out is a good way of doing it. And then um, lastly, I guess one other point is um, restrict the use of like persistent dewormers. So your macrocyclic lactone, so like ivermect, um, because it lasts in the body a lot longer, um, there's more opportunity for parasites to kind of develop resistance. Um, so what happens, you know, when we talk about developing resistance, basically parasites that, um, manage to survive, um, you know, being dosed a, a dewormer, you know, they reproduce and they have an immunity to this dewormer and they pass on kind of like resistant genes to future generations. Um, so just like quick example, like if you have, let's say a hundred worms for easy math in a sheep and you drench that animal and you end up with 10 worms that survive okay, doesn't seem like a big deal. You know, you still had a 90% efficacy of that dewormer. Well, now that 10 worms, you know, if they reproduce, um, and let's just say it's homunculus contortus that lays 5,000 eggs a day. Well, now you have, you're multiplying, you know, that ability to be resistant to the dewormer to a lot of other worms. So you can see how that population in developing that resistance can come quite quickly if you have a very prolific worm like um, homunculus contortus. Um, so my second point that I always kind of talk about when we're talking about um, preventing, you know, or minimizing parasite challenges is, you know, keep, you know, drench resistant worms from your property. So when you get new animals in, it's a good idea to drench all, all new animals. And hopefully, you know, you should be quarantining it from the rest of your animals, you know, to check for other diseases too, but also from a parasite standpoint, it's a good idea to kind of keep them separate, treat them and, you know, wait a couple days, you know, um, or ideally if you're quarantining them a couple weeks, you know, before you're introducing it to your main um, flock. Um, and it's, this is, can also kind of be a point um, for just, you know, when you, you just drench in general, if it's possible, it's a good idea to kind of um, dry lot your animals after you deworm them. So like in a yard or barn for one to three days. So it's important to note dewormers kill um, 
worms, but they don't kill the eggs. So what ends up happening is, and this is sometimes the reason why dewormers fail, is that we drench the animals and you throw them out on clean pasture. Well, you know, they're pooping out all the eggs that you know, was left in the body that hadn't gone through yet. And so now they're just kind of reinfecting that pasture. So, you know, if you can hold off on putting them on um, new pasture or something like that right after you deworm them, that can help break that life cycle. Even if you put them on kind of, you drenched them, put them on your dirty pasture, so to speak, you know, for a day or two and then moving them to clean pasture. Um, that's a better way of kind of handling it and kind of helping prevent, you know, reinfection um, from occurring. Um, so some other points, you know, on minimizing parasite challenges is making sure that you have proper nutrition. Um, so worms, especially, uh, they use a lot of um, protein. And I don't know that I've seen any studies that have like shown a huge, uh, I've, I've seen a study that showed that basically um, in late lactation use, you know, that are heavily parasitized that they can use about like 2.5% more protein um, than normal. And that's just um, because, you know, like when you're talking about like homunculus contortus, you know, they're sucking, sucking a lot of blood and it takes a lot of protein to kind of resupply that. Um, so, you know, if you're supplying um, the animals um, with good nutrition, this can help kind of boost their immune system and kind of help um, prevent or, you know, lessen the effects of parasites, you know, than if your um, animals are under, you know, underfed or, you know, in poor nutrition. Um, and uh, so this is also an important note is um, genetics. Genetics can play a huge part in kind of parasites. Um, so it's always kind of said that 70% of worms will be shed from 30% of your herd or flock. Um, so, you know, when you think about it that way, you know, if you only have 30% of your animals shedding 70% of the worms, if you can find that 30% and you can get rid of them, that's going to help you kind of rely less on dewormers um, if you can find those particular animals that are giving you the most problems. And um, the last kind of point I had was um, just, you know, what are other alternatives, you know, to dewormers um, that you can use in your animals to prevent parasite challenges? And this, um, um, I guess I'll go first into kind of like pasture considerations. I mean, I talked a little bit about that, um, but, you know, just thinking about your grazing period. Um, so your auto infection period, so from when the animals lay, uh, poop out, um, the worm eggs and their feces until they hatch out, you know, and get re-ingested from the animals is about four to 10 days. So if you're on a, already on a rotationally grazing um, pasture system, if you can rotate those animals, you know, before they've been on there for um, four days, you can help kind of break that parasite life cycle because um, it prevents those worms from being re-ingested. Um, some other like considerations is just rest time for your pastor. So this is, you know, just time stock is not on the pastor. And um, the amount of time that you allow rest, it's, I mean, I've seen quite a bit of variation in numbers. Um, it takes, you know, uh, basically three weeks, you know, for a parasite to go through its entire life cycle. Um, and they can survive on pasture for several weeks. Um, so it's kind of hard to get like a good rest period um, to minimize those in infections. But the longer that you can, you know, provide, you know, rest, um, hopefully the more worms and stuff that um, will die on pasture and not um, infect your animals. Um, so in so rest time too can be um, if you switch your stock so like between like 
sheep and cows, they're a good, um, they work really well together because the worms that are in sheep, you know, aren't necessarily in cows um, or they're not very, there's not a lot of overlap. So, you know, if you have a pasture that you have sheep on there, well, now you can switch it with cows, you know, and that can be considered a rest period. Um, also, if you kind of manage your pasture height, so from what we know from parasites is basically when they're a younger parasite, so like that L3 stage, you know, is when they crawl up on the grass and that's considered the infective stage for animals. They only crawl up like the first couple inches of the grass. So you can see from um, this um, picture to the right that basically if you don't graze your grass under probably three inches, four inches, you know, most of the worms are going to be, you know, on the bottom of the grass. Um, and that's going to help prevent, you know, reinfection by your animals um, just by, you know, not overgrazing your pastures and making sure that there's plenty height there that they're not grazing it down to the, you know, ground. Um, so some other alternatives. Um, and again, there's so many different things that, you know, have been kind of shown um, to have an effect against parasites. Um, these are just some products that I know of on the market now. Bioverma is um, one product. Um, it's a type of fungi um, and it's supposed to be really, really effective. Basically, it traps, you know, the younger larvae of worms um, and prevents them from reproducing. Um, but so in goats, it's been shown to reduce like the fecal egg counts of goats by like 86%. So it's pretty effective. The downside to it, it's super expensive. Um, the last time I looked, a 100 pound animal needs about 0.1 ounce, which equates to about 20 to 21 cents. And that's a per day um, cost because in order for it to be effective, it has to be fed daily. So that's definitely, um, you know, a negative of that product. Um, some other products, so copper oxide wire particles, um, this has been shown to be very effective for uh, um, the homunculus contortus, that barber pole worm. Um, and basically, you know, you feed an, an encapsulated um, gel of product that has these little tiny car copper wire particles and that lodges into the um, abomasum of the stomach um, and that somehow prevents the um, parasites from feeding on the animal. Um, the problem with that, um, well, it's copper. So um, definitely for sheep, you know, copper toxicity is a definite you know, concern um, and even to some point, um, some extent with goats as well, it is possible to overfeed it. Um, just some other alternatives quick. Um, there is a product called Barbervax, which is basically a shot that you give that helps, um, it doesn't kill worms, but it helps um, build up immunity um, to worms, you know, so they uh, don't re reproduce as much and it reduces the fecal egg counts. Um, problem with this product, not available in the US. Um, and I know there's been some talk of, you know, or some discussion on its efficacy because you need up to three doses to gain any sort of immunity from it. Um, and the last product, I guess, or alternative that I was just going to kind of point out was um, this BT crystal protein. So this was some research that was recently done last year um, that has shown, you know, so this BT um, crystal protein, that's, you know, what you kind of see in like um, BT corn and that sort of thing. Um, it's really good at reducing um, the fecal egg counts um, of that homunculus contortus and also reducing parasite burdens um, in sheep. But all of this research was only done like in the lab. So it hasn't been done in real animals. Um, so there is going to be, you know, it's going to be several years before any commercial development or um, being able to see this on the market. Um, so 
kind of the last point that I always point out um, about, you know, using dewormers and stuff properly is just avoiding the overuse of it and maintaining kind of refuge of it. Um, so if nobody's ever told you, it's okay to not deworm animals as long as your animals are healthy, you know, and handling it, um, you know, the amount of worms that they have, you know, if you feel like your animals don't need to be dewormed, it's okay not to. Um, but again, this is something, you know, work with your vet, you know, make sure that you're not going to get any problems by, you know, just suddenly not deworming. Um, but some ways that you can kind of look at and, you know, and assess if your animals are, you know, handling worms okay is, you know, doing what they call a five point check. Um, so this is, you know, where you're looking at um, kind of the nose of the animals, if they have any discharge, looking at the eyes, um, you know, for looking at kind of uh, doing FAMACHA scoring, seeing if they have any anemia, um, like up in that upper right corner picture, you know, just looking at the color of the eyelid, you know, if, you know, it's really white, that means that they probably have a huge parasite load in, um, that are sucking um, basically blood from the animal. And then, you know, using things like um, looking at the bottom of the jaw. Um, so when you have blood sucking um, parasites like Comuncus contortus, you know, um, the cost of, you know, sucking away blood is that all that fluid that's normally in, in tied up in the red blood cells, um, it escapes, you know, into the body and you basically get edemia. So you get the swelling in the jaws and it can also occur like in the stomach area and that sort of thing. Um, and so that can be an indication of parasites. Um, your condition of your animals, uh, that can also, um, if you have a really skinny animal, sometimes, you know, you know, parasite, parasites can be a cause of, you know, them losing condition and stuff just because they can't consume enough nutrients to maintain um, their requirements. And then kind of the last point is, you know, looking at the tail. Um, a lot of the worms, because they burrow into the intestine and the stomachs, um, basically it causes damage to those um, tissues and you get kind of like what they call like leaky gut. And then, you know, you can have a lot of problems with uh, diarrhea and that sort of problems. Um, so these are just kind of some things that you can look at your animals to visually assess if, you know, they're having a problem with parasites. Um, and I kind of say stated this earlier, um, but when we talk about kind of refuge, um, that's just, basically having worms that aren't exposed to dewormer. Um, so when you have animals that you deworm and potentially develop, you know, some resistant genes to that dewormer, you have a population to kind of dilute, um, you know, the ones with resistance um, with parasites that don't have um, resistance to dewormer. And so like a goal of, you know, a goal is to um, untreat or don't treat, you know, 30% of your flock in that, that way, you know, you're always maintaining kind of a population of worms that aren't developing and creating resistant um, genes to your dewormers. So this is kind of the five point check that I was talking about in um, the other slide. Um, yeah, so, you know, you look at your eyes, you look at their back, their tail, their jaw. Um, so in sheep, we look at the nose, you know, for just discharge. Um, for goats, um, sometimes, you know, the fifth checkpoint, they talk about the coat of the animal, um, because if you have parasites, that can kind of start affecting um, what the coat looks like, and it can look quite rough and stuff if you have parasites. Um, so these are just... Um, some things that you can check and on the far right of the uh, table is just kind of some worms that might um, cause, you know, some of those symptoms. And this will be put up later. Um, so, uh, oh, well, this, this presentation will be recorded so you can um, re reference this later.
So um, I guess that was kind of all of my slides on kind of like dewormer and preventing resistance and that sort of thing. Um, so today I was going to do a fecal egg count. And unfortunately, our fancy uh, microscope that we have, the HDMI port stopped working. So I'm not going to be able to do a live fecal egg count. Um, but I kind of just took a picture of some of the tools that I use. Um, so the main thing is that you're going to need some sort, you're going to need a fecal sample. So from your animals, um, usually when I'm collecting fecal samples, I just go out in the barn, I stand around, I wait for somebody to poop, and then I just, you know, s scoop up, you know, fresh sample. Um, you, that's the easiest way to do it, or if you have them in the race or something like that, um, there's always a sheep pooping somewhere or a goat. Um, and it's just important to make sure that, you know, the sample's fresh. It's not been sitting out on the ground for a while. If it has been, um, those worms might have already started hatching out of the eggs. Um, ideal, so if you're also not measuring your fecal egg counts right away, um, you can refrigerate the samples and that will help preserve those eggs until you're ready to do it. Um, don't freeze them because that kind of burst the eggs and it doesn't work very well. Um, so the next step kind of like is um, in order to measure your fecal egg um, counts is that you need a flotation solution. So generally we just use pickling salt or um, yeah, basically a saturated salt solution. Um, so I like to use pickling salt um, just because if you use table salt, um, it does work, um, but a lot of table salt has like an anti-caking agent in it. So um, it's just harder to mix in the water. So pickling salt works really well. Um, and then from there, basically gonna measure out about two grams into a um, fecal sample into a cup. Um, you're gonna add about uh, 28, um, milliliters of your flotation solution and you're going to mix that all up um, and then I like to strain um, that solution and use a pipette and I put it in what's called um, to measure your fecal egg counts a uh, um, McMaster slide. So on the bottom right is kind of a slide um, and you can see you know a square with some grid lines in there. Um, basically you pipette your your fecal um, salt water solution in there and you're going to measure or count the number of eggs that are in that grid area. Um, so and to count it you're going to need a microscope. Um, so your microscope really doesn't need to be that fancy. It just needs to have a 10x lens and from what you're going to see from there. Oh I should have Okay, I'll jump to this next slide. Um, so basically what you're gonna see under the microscope is um, basically, uh, so on the left here is a picture uh, looking at a sample under a microscope. So the kind of blue lines that you see are those blue grid lines on the McMaster slide. And I like to just find a corner, start at one corner, you go up it, um, I'll go back. If um, start at one corner, go up the slide, you know, count down, go up, go down until you get all the way to the end. Um, hopefully you can see my mouse. I don't know if you can see it, but um, just, you know, count them in a zigzag fashion so you're not skipping any lines. And you do that for both sides of the slide. So you'll have one chamber and then two chamber. And um, what you're looking for is basically round eggs. So on this first slide um, to the left, I can see three um, eggs in here. So there's one over to the left on the blue line, there's one up towards the top, and there's one kind of towards the middle. So these darker circles, all that is is air bubbles. Um, and you're just looking for these kind of round oval shape worms. Those are gonna be indication of your strongle or your nematode type worms that I introduced, you know, at the beginning of this presentation. So 
And to the right, I kind of have a blow up picture of what that round oval um, circle looks like. And next to it is a smaller little egg. So if you see any kind of small eggs like that, that's coccidia. Um, and you will always see those in, you know, if it's a goat or a sheep poop sample, you'll always see them um, in there. Um, but generally, when we're talking about doing fecal egg counts, you're not going to count the coccidia, you're just looking for those round oval shape eggs. So um, I'm going to bounce back to this side slide. Um, so this is basically the uh, types of eggs that you can see um, that are common in cheap poo. Um, so those oval shape eggs um, right down here on the bottom left is kind of what you're looking for. So these three eggs, so you can see the first one, it says homunculus contortus, ostertagia, um, that's your, uh, uh, um, what do they call it, um, t or your telesurdagia um, worms. Um, these are the top three worms that I introduced at the beginning of the presentation that are most problematic. And you can see from the drawings that there are some differences, but under a microscope, you really aren't gonna be able to tell the difference. So you just look for eggs about this size and you count those um, as part of your fecal egg counts. And then up top here, you can see a lot of these small, like, you know, round eggs, anything smaller than that, it's probably going to be coccidia. Um, the only, and then, yeah, so basically when you're doing fecal egg counts, you're just looking for these round oval eggs and that's what you're counting. Anything else, um, unless you're specifically looking for it, you're not going to include them. Um, so in the top right, you'll sometimes see um, this Monenza expansa, my Latin, it's not good, um, but that's basically tapeworm and they, they're kind of a triangle shape egg and you'll sometimes see those in fecal samples too. Um, but like I kind of said in the very beginning of the presentation, they're not very pathogenic, so you usually don't worry about them, um, just let them be. And then, in the right of this um, kind of chart is a Nema di diaris. So you won't see these too much in, if you do like a, a fecal egg count and you're doing a flotation um, solution, you're not gonna generally see these eggs just because they're so big. Um, and this, this chart doesn't have liver flukes on there, but liver flukes are as big as this Nema diaris diertis um, egg, so you won't see them um, in your solution. You generally, just because they're too big, they won't float on that um, salt water solution. So um, after you kind of like counted, you know, from those different chambers, um, basically from both sides of the chambers, you add up the number of eggs and you're gonna times it um, by a certain number. Um, so you're gonna have this, what's called a, a multiplication factor. So for my particular example, it's gonna be 50. Um, so if you ever wanna do like fecal eggs, um, at home, like you can buy a kit, you know, and these are, I, I call them just McMaster slides. That's what they are. You can find them on Amazon or um, I think there's a McMaster website too, but they come with uh, generally, and I'll hold it up to the screen, um, like kind of a card that tells you how um, to do it. And um, this one's a little different. Um, so the multiplication factor, basically it just makes sure that the amount of solution to um, basically grams of feces is the same ratio. So that can vary a little bit depending on the procedure you're using. Um, so for the, my particular sample, I use two grams of um, basically fecal um feces to 28 mils of that flotation solution. So, and I put on the bottom that sometimes you'll see um, four grams of feces used to 26 mils of flotation um, solution. And basically then this um, multiplication factor would just be 
25. And, and that's just telling you that one egg that you count on that slide, you know, represents either 50 eggs per gram or 25, depending on um, how much feces and stuff you're using. So that's kind of your limitation to um, your, um, your fecal egg count. So when we talk about looking for like resistance and stuff in dewormers, we talk about a fecal egg reduction test. Um, so this is where you use, you calculate the effic efficacy of the dewormers by taking a fecal sample before you deworm and then after. And it's gonna, um, when you take that fecal sample afterwards, it's gonna depend on the type of dewormer that you're using. So you can see in the second kind of bulletin um, point, you know, I have the different groups, the three different groups of um, dewormers possible and um, kind of a general outline, you know, of when you should be taking those samples. Um, and this is basically the number of days is based off of um, you know, how long it takes for that dewormer to be metabolized in the animal. So, and if you're using a combination of these different dewormers, then generally you just use 14 days after you deworm to check for your fecal egg count. Um, and so when you're doing this, you're basically looking for an average 95% or yeah, a greater than 95% reduction in fecal egg counts. Um, so on the right, there's kind of just a table, like how you would um, do this. So if your sample one is um, your fecal egg counts before you dewormed, let's just say, so take this first animal, it's 2,500. And then you take a fecal sample after you deworm, um, which is sample two, it's 250. You just figure out the difference, um, which is 2,250 eggs. And you're just going to find, you know, how much of, you know, how much of a reduction that is. And you can see um, the percent kill was 90%. And if you do, um, generally, when you do these tests, you look at 10 to 15 animals in your flock or whatever group that you're looking at. And ideally, when you do those 10 to 15 animals and you calculate the average, you want it above a 95% reduction. So I know that was a lot, but that's all I have. So is there any questions? Kelly, there's one question in the chat that says, um, should sheep be drenched on an empty stomach or does it matter? Um, that's a good question. Um, so it there has been research done that shows that basically if you withhold feed before you drench animals, it makes it um, the dewormers more effective. Um, and the reason why that is because if the animals haven't eaten, um, basically it slows down the rate of passage um, of feed stuff in, you know, their intestine in the rumen and stuff, which also slows down the amount that the dewormer is going to go through the animal. So it does, yes, like if you hold withhold the animal from feed, you know, like 24 hours or 12 hours, you know, prior to drenching, it does increase the efficacy of your dewormers. Um, yeah, and I, Heidi threw it in the chat. Um, uh, there is an article that um, just got put on um, the SDSU Sheep and Goat Extension webpage. Um, that's you know a good resource. I can pull it up if you want. Oh, I don't know if you guys can see that. Jalen, can you see that? No. Oh, 
Okay. Um, hang on, let me just stop sharing and I'll reshare quick. Now, can you see it? Yep. Okay, so this is just kind of, you know, um, basically a brief article, are your dewormers effective for your sheep or goat? Um, and the thing that I have in here that I didn't bring up in my presentation is there's a really nice chart that's showing all the dewormers and stuff available for both sheep and goats and their kind of recommended dose. Um, especially for goats, you know, there's not a lot of, the only dewormer that's FDA approved for goats is Safeguard. Um, and the dose that's labeled on there is generally recommended to be upped. Um, but this is, you know, something that, you know, you should talk with your vet, especially in the goats, because most of these dewormers that are meant for sheep um, aren't actually approved in goats. So um, extra label basically means that you need to have, you know, vet approval to use them um, because they're not, you know, officially approved for that species animal. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Yeah, uh, you have talked about the uh, genetics control. Uh, so can we do uh, control in the sheep or goats or any type of other animal uh, to be controlled from the worms? Um, I'm, I guess I'm sorry, what was your question? You're, you wanted to know if we can do genetic control as far as the worms? Yeah. Yeah, um, so yeah, so there is, um, you can get animals which basically have a resilient, um, resiliency to worms um, that some animals when they have a, a load of parasites, you know, you would never know that they actually have worms, you know, they handle them really, really, really well. Um, or, you know, you have animals that are actually resistant to it for whatever reason, you can throw them on a pasture that has a high worm burden and, you know, never seem to get, you know, a lot of worms. And so you can kind of um, breed for it, for that. So that's what I was kind of saying um, in the PowerPoint, you know, 70% of the worms you know, usually comes from 30% of your animals in your flock or herd. So, you know, if you're finding that 30% that is most problematic and you start calling those out, you can make so, some genetic progress towards, um, you know, a flock that's more resistant um, to uh, worms. It's just, it's not a fast progression, basically. Okay, thank you. Um, can one of the symptoms of worms be acting different and stomping around? Um, yep. So sometimes like, I'm not quite sure, um, just from what you're saying, like sometimes if you see animals that like have their head down and stomping around, sometimes that can mean, um, they have bot flies, which are basically, it's when if you, in the summer it happens, like, um, basically you get like worms like in the nasal passage and it um, really bugs the animal and they do kind of some funny things and they tend to like put their head down and stomp around and get all agitated. Um, so maybe that's what you're talking about. Um, and then Travis Hoffman, I guess in the chat, he was just um, pointing out there is an NSIP breeding value for fecal egg counts, um, but is not available for all breeds and certainly a small set of breeders collecting this information. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah. Um, NSP, 
NSAP, you know, does have that available to, for some breeds, um, but um, like kind of Travis pointed out, you know, it's a small set of breeders that are really looking at it because it is a little bit time consuming, you know, to collect um, fecal egg counts and stuff on animals and kind of testing that for individual um, animals. So. Um, there's one more question. Can bot flies transmit from other animals to sheep? Um, I, are you talking about like from sheep to sheep or other animals? Um, well, so bot flies, um, I mean, basically it's, it's passed along by flies. Um, so, uh, yes, um, equine to sheep. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that because I don't know a lot about parasites in horses, to be honest. Um, but it's transmitted from by flies, so it's quite possible. Um, I would have to read up if bot flies are an issue in horses or not. I'm, I'm not a horse person. I guess I don't know that question, um, but it certainly is a possibility. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's just something, you know, if you have a vet that you work with that maybe you can ask them and they might know a little bit more about parasites of horses. It's just not my um, expertise. So I haven't done a whole lot <laughs> or nothing at all with um, parasites in horses. So Right. Are there any other questions or um, for me? Um, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I can put up back up my screen. I don't have a question, but I'd like to say thank you. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, hopefully you can see my screen, but um, there's my phone number and email. So if you do have any questions or think of anything later on down the road, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'll be happy to answer anything the best to my knowledge or find somebody who's very knowledgeable about it. So yep. And like Heidi just put in the chat, so recordings will be um, made public. So um, and we'll share it with you guys later on down the road if you need a you find anything that you want to take another look at so